let's start off a little bit about um, kind of a short version of your story as far as how you ended up at Augsburg, so we can kind of see what uh, what that trajectory looked like, looked like and, and what you discovered when you got here. I'm, I am a faculty brat. Uh, nobody ever told me there was anywhere else. Uh, I graduated from high school here in Minneapolis, at Roosevelt High School, and almost all of my high school friends who went on to college were across the river at the University of Minnesota, which seemed to me to be a far more glamorous place than this. Uh, but but I, I came here. Uh, because I was local, I, my, my father was on the faculty, uh, I didn't live on campus the whole time I was here, I lived at home, which meant that my experience of Augsburg was not in the dorms. Uh, primarily what went on in the classrooms is what my experience was here, and it was very, very good. Uh, I was involved with extracurricular stuff. I edited the yearbook um, a couple of years. Uh, so that sort of thing was part of my experience as well. But it was as an off-campus kid, as we called ourselves. Just kind of the rarer experience, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Well, it really wasn't. I think it was probably as many as half of the students. When I, I was here in the, the late 50s, came here in 55, graduated in three and a half years in, in January of 59. Uh, one of the phenomenon from, from that era was the number of GIs that were, or ex GIs that were on campus with the GI Bill, so they were, which I thought was a a really interesting addition to the student body. These were guys who had had experience all over the world, uh, were definitely back here settling down, in a sense, but they had a, a sort of a tough, realistic view of the world that was a, a nice addition, a nice addition to our experience here, to the classroom discussion. So those guys were all, of course, living off campus. After four years in the Navy, you are not going to subject yourself to dorm regulations if you don't have to. So. Been there and done that. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, I keep hearing about kind of World War II as this kind of sea change for mm. the school in terms of it diversifying the student body and some changing priorities and leadership changing, I guess, in the 30s in terms of these relatively long presidential tenures. Yeah, Christensen like. was, came in the 30s. Yeah, and uh -huh. so we're kind of in the middle of that arc, it sounds mm -hmm. like. So th there was a lot of change going on in the time mm -hmm. that while you were here. One of the things Bernard Christensen did, of course, was a masterful job of recruiting faculty. And uh, my dad was part of that. He was, he was uh, pastor in a parish in Wisconsin, and uh, Bernard Christensen asked him to come to Augsburg he taught uh, in, the, in the seminary, he taught religion in the college, and he headed the Scandinavian department in the college. That was uh, the era of uh, sort of the Renaissance man or woman who, who did it all. And that was, I, I kind of expected it sounded like you, were, you would just fill in wherever it was needed and take on as much responsibility I, as you could stand? Yeah. Um, uh, tell me about, um, what some of these, let's talk about some of the kind of thematic threads that sure. we've identified. What, how those looked, how they played themselves out, how you saw them and what happened here. Let's start with that freedom one, because it sounds like that's so integral. Kind of one always resisting kind of being absorbed by the larger uh, mm -hmm. uh, church uh, unions and syn synods and stuff, but, but also just wanting to make sure you do it the way that everybody's decided we want to do it. The freedom I experienced most significantly in the classroom. Uh, and I didn't really realize uh, how privileged we were at that time until I, well, I got to graduate school or I got out and started talking to people with different experiences. And uh, I never felt in any of the classes here that it was wrong to question. Uh, that was sort of expected, uh, even though we were brash young people. We very often would ask inappropriate questions. and um, not, not really put down, though, for, for ever questioning. Um, and you've probably heard some of the stories of, of some of the teachers who were just particularly excellent at that. Uh, Paul Sonic is one that comes to mind in the religion department. But there were others, too. There were, uh, that, and that's 
when I think of the freedom here in Augsburg, that's, that's the kind of freedom I think of. I think um, because of the history, of the, the history of the founders and of the, the supporters all along, they sort of came out of that intense ferment of the 19th century in Europe, and particularly in Norway, which was, you know, between being a colony of Denmark and getting its real freedom after they got the Swedes out of there. Uh, so all of the nationalism that was going on in Norway was part of that. Uh, the religious developments with the, with the Haugian movement in Norway, all of that transferred here in a sense uh, and was expressed in that, that idea that not that you could ever be intellectually sloppy. Uh, there was strong expectation in those classrooms that that uh, you would you would give an account for what you said academically, but you could question. Which is that is a very brave thing to do, and, and is usually enjoyed to think at larger universities where they've got you know <clears throat> all the. the the top paid folks who mm -hmm. can kind of manage mm -hmm. that stuff. But, and I think there's that impression that, um, that a kind of piety would translate to a kind of anti-intellectualism, you know, yeah. that we wouldn't want to question that because it's, it's almost like a fundamentalism. Yeah. yeah. So to be able to say, no, that we are absolutely unambiguous uh, about what we believe and that gives us the freedom to do inquiry, that's pretty radical. Yeah, I, I have said that our, our piety was never the en enemy of the intellect. Uh, in fact, it was part of it, because part of what our piety told us um, was that all of us, including the laity, had a responsibility. We had a vocation. I mean, the word vocation wasn't used then perhaps as much as it's been in recent years, but that was the idea. We were all called. It wasn't only the clergy that were called. We were all called, and part of that was you had a responsibility to God to do the best you could. So if you were intellectually sloppy, that was, that was sin. You, know, you were not making the best of what God had given you to use. That's accountability, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I think that uh, the brilliance of putting uh, laity in the, in the driver's seat in the, in the um, creation of quality pastors puts things in the proper kind of Lutheran tension mm -hmm. to say, no, the, the priesthood is for the service of the community and the congregation and the, and the world, and not vice versa. This isn't kind of catering, this isn't the ivory tower kind of uh, experience, and we don't want pastors that are like that. So, did, did you see that trend of that kind of democratic democratization of education? A, a lot. Now, I, and again, I, sh I should, I, it, it wasn't all uh, beer and skittles as far as that goes. It was, I was a, a girl, and wouldn't yet have been designated as a woman. Um, and being female in the 50s was a very different experience. Uh, there were kind of ridiculous expectations of uh, how proper young Christian ladies would behave that we sort of rebelled against. Um, but that was cultural, that was, that was not necessarily integral to, to what the school itself was. Never felt that, in, again, in the classroom. I never felt, never felt at all put down for being a, a, a woman. You want to be able to ask questions, even if maybe they're stupid questions. Oh, yeah. But you have the freedom to do it. That's that same kind of yeah. democracy in education. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. says everybody's entitled to ask, because it might be the most important question that get, gets asked, and you don't know kind of yeah. until you try it. Kind of and we, we could challenge our teachers as quickly as we would challenge each other, which made for some pretty lively classes. I was reading an article that uh, Frank Shackford had written, and someone there, there was a, a quote of a professor, I don't remember which one, who would lecture for the whole hour and then at the very end say, but I could be wrong. <laughs> that was Sonic. <laughs> That's, yes, you, wouldn't, yes. you wouldn't find that in a lot of places, I would no, guess. No. Especially a religion department. <laughs> right, right, it was great. That's great. Uh, and then, uh, uh, let's talk about the local thing, the kind of, that it's really embedded in the community geographically. Uh, it was a kind mm -hmm. of a doorstep uh, facing that way before the freeway, mm -hmm. which probably you uh, were around for, but it was always kind of embedded in this kind of ever-evolving cauldron of, of immigrants moving through yeah. and communities changing. Oh, yeah. Tell me what I, that was like. Well, I, 
one of the themes that I had thought about that you didn't touch on, that in my experience in the 50s really was unusual, was a real sort of global sense here. I mean, this was the Eisenhower years when the country was supposed to be isolationist in a sense. Um, and I think the history of the school lent itself to a more international viewpoint because of that long connection with, with Europe, uh, and Norway particularly, but theologically and, uh, well, all of the, the trends that were going on in, in Europe during those founding years, but also because of the Lutheran Free Church foreign mission emphasis. There have always been missionary kids among the student body. Um, the year I came here, I think the entire graduating class of the uh, school in Madagascar came to Oxford. There were three of them, but, <laughs> but uh, that presence on campus always uh, sort of, yeah, we were, we were embedded here in South Minneapolis, but there was always a sense of the world. And there were, I, I, between my junior, my, my sophomore and junior years, I spent a summer at the University of Oslo, and there, was, there wasn't the kind of intensive um, you know, semester abroad kind of experience that a lot of schools have now. But there were a number of us who did have some international experience during our time here. There was uh, always a, a group of SPAN students, if you're familiar with, with that program. Why don't you tell me about that? Student Project for Amity Among, Among Nations, and they would they would go to um, another country and uh, research a topic of their own devising and do a paper on it. Do, um, and that was, you know, that was also those returning SPAN students coming back here uh, kept that awareness of, of what was going on in the world. Remember in, in 1956 when the Hungarian uprising was on television. I think there was one television probably on campus, but, but uh, how immediate that felt that that was happening and it was affecting me here in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. So that's, that's part of an answer to your question. It's actually the same answer because it's kind of that the world has come to your doorstep mm -hmm. and whether that's through television or by going there and mm -hmm. being sent there. And I think it reflects that sense of vocation, but it's for the sake of the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're not here just because it's a great education. It's expected that you'll go do you, something you, really yeah, useful right. with it. Yeah. And that that's been there since the first rural yeah. pastors, and it's here now in the middle of... And the there program. were always immigrants among the student body. Um, in my era, I remember... Uh, in relatively small classes, but a, a, a young woman from Hungary who had come out of that uh, student uprising. Um, uh, a fellow from Japan, a girl from Korea in my class. Um, in the seminary at the time, Andrew Shaw, who became president of the seminary in Hong Kong. Uh, so we weren't all that Midwestern isolated. It would be, be a mistake to think of it that way. Yeah. Even though you could, you could be accused of it if you weren't looking at the facts. Mm -hmm. You could just be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of an insular, uh, you know, it, it could have gone that way if, if people hadn't kept focus. Yeah, I think so. Focus. But that focus was always there. It was... Well, and it leads to this access and a, and a quality kind of thing that's, you know, it's about getting great education into the hands of people who need it. and and making, uh, making it available, and that's transformed into all kinds of things for adaptive learners, and I mean, I'm, sure, I'm sure these days it's even more uh, technologically driven, but it's always been a value to kind of, that's how the prep academy probably was started back in the end of the 19th, 20th century, 19th century, uh, and evolved into the college, was kind of like, well, if you want good pastors, you gotta do this, and the, you yeah, back the, up a the, couple The steps. academy, the college, and the seminary were established at the same time. Uh, because that was the view of the founders that those pastors needed an integrated education from high school through seminary. Um, the school was not accessible to women. 
until somewhat later. Um, and, and that kind of probably paralleled the point when, when the college started educating more than just pastors. Uh, there was there was accessibility, I think, to um, to students who hadn't had a great high school experience. Um, a lot of students coming from very small rural uh, high schools, and for whom you know their experience was a lot different than mine, uh, but that experience of coming here and being caught, brought up to speed becoming very good students was, was always part of it. Um, as was the experience for um, metro area students who very often, in, including in my case, could not have afforded a private college education without being able to continue living at home and to commute to school. And that, that was the case for a lot of people. In which case, the urban setting was a huge advantage. Oh, yeah. As opposed to being out in fields in Northfield or somewhere. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and the returning GIs and that diversification right. was also, and, and whoever else came, I'm right. sure it's so well, the, the, was This only. was a place where they could, those returning GIs could get an education and their wives could find a job. <laughs> I mean, that was very often the case. Uh, a lot of those guys were even fathers by the time they got here, so. Somebody in the family had to have a job. But it was, it was uh, and I'm sure it was a tumultuous time to try to figure out how much of that kind of core Lutheran identity do we kind of yeah. cling to as the sole mission versus a mm -hmm. much broader mission of Yeah, the, the time when I was here was uh, when the, the merger that became the ALC was being hotly discussed in the, in the church. It uh, didn't happen until 1963, but it was definitely a factor. Uh, and there, I think among a lot of us as students, there was something of a feeling that uh, the LFC was kind of the podunk little brother of Lutheranism and we should get along with, with uh, the crowd. Um, that's part of the smart alecky attitude maybe that we came with. Well, and it's 55 or whatever years after it had kind of been put together the first time, so yeah. it's, it probably had kind of gone through some evolution and, yeah. and change. Well, tell me about your LFC experience, because it's, uh, it's so unique and it's so um, different, I think, from most people's experience in, in a whole variety of ways to the, the kind, of, uh, kind of evangelical side of it that mm -hmm. would terrify <laughs> the typical kind of ALC, you know, yeah. type Lutheran. Um, wow. Where to start? Um, we'll talk about the the experiential faith that, that you alluded to. Um, when it became uh, sort of fashionable a decade or so ago to start talking about spirituality, uh, I wasn't quite sure what people were talking about, but it was a really hot item. And then they began to explain it, and I said, "Oh, that." Uh, that's, that's what we did in the LLC. I mean, the, the emphasis was on faith as something you experienced, God as someone you knew, uh, relationship. The, the, the way it was phrased was you have to know Jesus, but it was definitely that emphasis on uh, faith being experienced. Um, not that I don't think uh, the faculty here ever strayed very far from Lutheran orthodoxy, but that was not the primary emphasis of the Free Church. It was that, and, and out of that came a lot of, a lot of the practices. I uh, told the story of when I was a kid in the Parsage in Wisconsin. I, one of the things I experienced was the congregation's weekly prayer meeting in our living room. Um, which my sister and brother and I, if we lay down on the floor and looked down through the hot air register, we could observe the prayer meeting going on. And there was one old fellow who uh, came early, took the best, most comfortable chair, an old Norwegian bachelor farmer. And he would pray at great length and twirl his thumbs as he prayed 
And my brother eventually figured out that when he was halfway through, he would reverse direction and twirl in the other way. So, uh, and, and in retrospect, I think, what a marvelous experience we had as children of watching, if you think of these cold, stony, old Norwegians, and they were passionate in their prayer. They prayed out loud, they prayed at length, um, they poured out all of their problems and their requests. Um, I mean, that, that was part of the experiential faith, was that praying out loud, which was, has always been part of my life, and I realize it has not been part of, of the faith experience for a lot of Lutherans. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that was something that wasn't really unique to the, the Free Church. There, there were certainly other, um, among the, the Haugians or the, uh, a lot of the Swedish Augustana pietists, but it was part of our experience. And certainly as you were kind of adopted into the bigger ALSC uh, kind of Lutheran family, that probably was a unique twist. Um, well, I think, I think maybe, yeah. Um, It's, and I, it's fascinating. I think to it's see still that. scary to a lot of people. <laughs> you know? And and because it's scary, um, those of us who have experienced it are kind of a little bit suspicious. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm sure that goes both ways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's it's that kind of, you can see that line from Hauge and mm -hmm. Janssen mm -hmm. that's just yeah. this kind of revival spirit. Yeah. And in contrast to, in Norway, the state church, which was this right. very kind of top-down, hierarchical, mm -hmm. kind of almost Martin Luther against the Roman church kind of mm -hmm. uh, structure, uh, megalithic, um, and therefore kind of devoid of <laughs> passion and mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have, kind of play that out in these kind of small congregational and family, I mean, that's, that's a really different experience than the kind of larger, mm -hmm. big church kind of experience. And so I, people, I think, would be surprised to discover that an inner city college with the kind of legacy of service and community engagement would have that kind of faith tradition. Uh, yeah, and it was, it was very much alive. Um, there, was, there was always an annual spiritual emphasis week well, during the years that I was here. Um, there, was, there was daily chapel. Oh. I think it was required attendance at chapel, um, but at least in my first couple of years, they didn't take attendance, so it was the whole honor system involved with that. I think later they started to at least require self-reporting of whether you went to chapel. Sermon notes or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, let's. Um... Uh, the civic engagement thing and the kind of so, uh, service-driven kind of mission is really unique. I, I, now people talk about it like it's a new idea, but I have been doing this a long time. Well, I think so. And it goes all the way back. I mean, I, I'm sure theologically, it certainly goes back to Luther and before, I and mean, I suppose the Holy Spirit, but uh, Oftedal and these other guys who, who lived that and mm -hmm. modeled it, mm -hmm. it, was, it was kind of right there, and it was... I suppose expected, but hopefully even lower than that, kind of ingrained in... Oh, yeah. That yeah. that experienced faith would also be experienced kind of living in the world. Well, it was part of that, God's given you all this to work with, and you better do something with it that serves God. Uh, and it, part of that, too, is that, that the lay folk weren't off the hook on that, that we, too, were, were expected to to be of service in the world as well as in the church, um, which was, was sometimes kind of a difficult tension between the notion of the pietists that we ought to keep ourselves apart from the world to avoid being tainted and the idea that we ought to be in the world working and always trying to sort of balance that or figure out where that where that balance ought to be um. and, and and the my favorite uh the, the temperance movement which 
to me, seems so antiquated. I remember looking at my dad's, um, yeah. when the temperance ladies had come through his town and he had all yeah. these little arts and crafts things that he'd done. <laughs> and he brought that book out. And it just seems like it's from another century. And, uh, well, it is. I suppose it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, to not, but to have the context of the kind of deep alcoholism problems of yeah. an immigrant community, I mean, just the, deadly. The, uh, yeah. Okay, now that has some, now it makes some sense. So there's, yeah. the, it, it's the principle of we don't do that, but the reason is still yeah. there. And, the reason and, and again, you could get a, and the, I think the Temperance Club was the first club or student organization on, at Augsburg. I could be wrong, but I mean, it's pretty early. But, but you've got a school that sits here in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood, which from the beginning has been a center of immigrants with all of the problems that that, that can bring. Um, a lot of young men living in a strange society without their mothers and sisters uh, and you've sort of got a breeding ground for a lot of social ills. And I think the, the Christians at the time saw this problem of, uh, really an intense social problem of drunkenness, public drunkenness, and, and lives that were being destroyed. Uh, and their answer to it was the temperance movement that you and I probably kind of chuckle at, but boy, they were trying to do something. And I, I said, I think that um, the Step Up program can be seen as sort of a direct great-grandchild of that, that emphasis. Again, it's the, we've got a responsibility for those people that we live with in this neighborhood. And that's, I think, a healthy response out of going from a piety that could turn fundamentalist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just be really insular mm -hmm. and locked in and we're just not going to go there, but instead says, no, 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 <laughs> we need to do this for the world. And the response at the time was kind of a prohibitionist mm -hmm. approach to that. But, and later it was like, well, at least once you start to understand brain chemistry and other things, you can have a different approach. But it's the same idea. Yeah. Treating a, a problem that yeah. hurts God's world and people. Yeah. Know. And of course, the temperance movement was also an early feminist movement, which I don't think here at Augsburg because there weren't female students, but, but that's... It was a uh, you know, the secret uh, yeah. <laughs> feminist club. Yeah. I suppose. Uh, the story of, and maybe you, maybe you maybe heard this, maybe, uh, uh, I think, was it Christensen? No, Sverdrup II? Anyway, when they, when they started to admit women, uh, that he had convinced the board to vote on it kind of in principle, that we're going to talk about it next year. <laughs> and then before the next session, he said, but we're going to let some women in as kind of a test to see if it works. Kind of snuck them in the back door so that by the time they I voted on it, that. yeah, it's great. That's so, great. By the time they voted on it, I was like, well, they're already here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just go. And they haven't caused any trouble. And they haven't caused it. <laughs> it's worked fine. There has been no disruption. There aren't any riots. So I just thought that was a, that was a clever way to do it. It yeah. sounds like that was kind of huh. George Frederick's uh, calling card was to kind of yeah. sneak consensus in there. <laughs> anyway, you could practical. Man. Um, well, as far as kind of that uh, t uh, leadership from kind of ground level, uh, I mean, obviously great, great leaders, but but they never got kind of too high up in the tower, and they had the they had the big view of what was happening, but they weren't too distant from the actual mm -hmm. doings of things. Did you have you seen that kind of legacy? Yeah, yeah. There's that, that and it's a it's an interesting and complex spirit around here. Um, Bill Frame used to refer to it as our militant modesty problem. It's, it comes out of the intense democratic, uh, small d democratic, uh, movements from, from Europe. Uh, but there, there has always been that egalitarian uh, spirit around here. That the, the, the downside of it is that I, I think I grew up thinking that the 11th commandment was thou shalt not get too big for thy britches. Uh, it was, you know, never blow your own horn. And, and that's the kind of unattractive aspect of that modesty. The, the wonderfully charming thing about it is that you, you've really had a lot of genuinely modest people and as properly understood, it was not that we're not gonna brag about anything, but all the glory goes to God. 
that uh, and God sees us all equally so we don't want to be hierarchical in our administration um, in our understanding of people that probably played into the fact that in the classroom I could ask those impertinent questions of my, my professors um, I don't know it, it, it's it's an interesting phenomenon, and, I, and it still it still plays out in the time when I was on the the board of regents here. I know that one of the issues was always that it was difficult to get the faculty to agree on anything because the faculty was used to that extreme egalitarianism and everybody's opinion counted, and so we're not going to take any consensus. Uh, it, it is it's I think it's kind of fun. I think it's kind of charming, but but it is definitely a part of the. Uh, the milieu here. It might, might lack efficiency at times. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and, I, and I said, but my understanding is that it goes back to this kind of, as long as we all agree on the mission yeah. of what we're really up to here, yeah. then, you know, my being president isn't about me being president. It's about me doing the best job yeah. for this school and yeah. people taking pay cuts and not getting a salary for a year. Oh, yeah. I think some of what Christian yes. and somebody did. And yes. So all that stuff, which could have, you know, great, a great opportunity to pat yourself on the back, was like, no, we're in the trenches here. We have yeah. things to do. We have work to do. And it's yeah. for the world. It's for these students. It's for the sake of the gospel. Yeah, that's exactly uh, it. So what, the, 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 the modesty was... was um, Kind of driven by that gospel mission. Yeah. Yeah, that's. It's fascinating. It's uh, <laughs> not the way most schools operate. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, Although I mean, it was again in, in keeping with the, the, the spirit around here, it was never a, a sort of a good buddy slap on the back kind of uh, relationship. I like to tell people that when I was a student here, I did take some classes from my father, and when I was in class, I called him Dr. Olson, and he called me Miss Olson. <laughs> it was just, it was a fairly formal atmosphere. Which I suppose was part of that rigor. Yes. Just taking yes. things really yes. seriously. Yes. Hmm. Um, let's see, well, uh, let's see, we've talked actually about most of this stuff. The dialogical teaching, you've talked a lot about that. Um, uh, the well, in in the time of transition, when uh, I'm trying to remember when accreditation happened, that was well, that was in the fifties. Was it? That was Tell a, me a little bit about that because it was it's it's part of that kind of being birthed out into was, the wider world. Story. Uh, early fifth, maybe fifty three. Uh, I remember when it was announced uh, that Augsburg had been accredited by the North Central Association because uh, we gave thanks for it at our family dinner table that, that, uh, on a Sunday. Uh, it was part of um, the recognition that Augsburg had entered the wider world of higher education, I think. I don't know that it necessarily changed the, the, what was going on here immediately. Uh, I'm sure that students in the early 50s experienced a lot of what I did with, with really uh, rigorous education in the classroom. Not, not it's not utopia. There were always some teachers that you knew you could slough off with, but but they were still nice people. <laughs> and, and I suppose it's that that freedom tug, that almost kind of stubbornness to to do it the way we want to do it because we've got a system we know you know yeah. is right. It sounds like they talked about trying to get accredited for like 15 years oh, before I'm it actually sure. happened. I'm sure. And, and I, most of it was probably, the standards were plenty high, that wasn't the problem, but the standards weren't the same. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, you know, that kind of stubbornness of like, mm -hmm. but this is the way we do it. And, you know, well, you probably, meeting somebody else's yeah. kind of... We probably did have uh, things like I alluded to earlier. My father's uh, uh, doctoral degree was in theology his master's degree was in Scandinavian and he was head of the Scandinavian department here. I, mean, I, I suspect that looks a little fishy, that kind of thing for accreditors. Uh, but and there, there may have been more of that sort of thing. Uh, people people uh, teaching and struggling through graduate degrees. I mean, that, that was, it was a case with my dad, but I think a lot of other faculty as well.
And probably not on a humongous salary. Oh, no. No. Uh, I think my father, well, I know he never made five figures in his life. I think he may have gotten up to $9,000 a year. Um, but it was, and we're still, you know, we, this school is still playing catch up with faculty salaries. We still have an extremely dedicated faculty that are, are here for the mission. It's almost kind of self-selecting, and it probably was even more so then, because mm. you could virtually guarantee you wouldn't make money teaching yeah. at Oxford, yeah. which meant you only got the most motivated people who really bought into it and yeah. were committed to it and were willing to do kind of ridiculous things financially. And um, the Karen's Plots story of the, the mm -hmm. apartments that were paid for first by this uh, servant girl, I yeah. guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that kind of stuff was just, what a... What a story! Yeah, what, yeah. And it's that it's that whole it's turning it all upside down again. Just that the most humble person would be the founding giver mm -hmm. for that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, just as the lay people would be making the pastors and not vice versa. Yes, it's part of that whole that whole legacy. I think. Yeah. Any other themes that I didn't really pick at, or any other fun stories, or <laughs> people who were really really life changing for you? Well, I, w I would say. I think I didn't really appreciate how good an education I got here until I got to graduate school at the University of Minnesota. Um, and it was, it was about eight years between, between those events. Um, but I got over to BU and sat in graduate classes, big, huge graduate classes. And I was appalled at the non-response of the students. <laughs> And I, you know, I, that was really good to know that, that I had been well prepared for that experience. Um, Jerry Thorson was head of the English department. I was an English major. Um, excellent teacher. A and again, one of those teachers who really held my feet to the fire and, and wouldn't put up with sloppy thinking. Um, very good memories. Yeah, it's it. When you're th when you're there, you're often thankful for the teachers who were kind of easy, <laughs> and when you leave, you're thankful for the ones who really yeah. put you to the test. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Exactly. Um, uh, and you've been connected. Tell me how you've been connected with the school since then. I don't really know your whole story. Really. Uh, I I don't even remember dates. I think in about 1978, I went on the alumni board. And then in 1982, I was elected to the Board of Regents and served actually 14 years. There was a gap of two years in between um, on, on the Board of Regents. Uh, I was secretary of the board for a spell. Uh, so that was, that was a wonderful experience, uh, probably one of the most rewarding volunteer experiences I've had was serving on that board. Uh, and then I have been very much involved with the uh, Bernard Christensen Fund from almost from the beginning of that, that uh, effort. And uh, now we've got Dave Teedy here on campus in that chair. We were pleased to have that be the first chair that was established here. Uh, and it's, it's exciting to see what's happened with it. He's dynamite. He's good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, some people are tempted, and I'm sure there's a decent argument to say that kind of Augsburg might have occasionally strayed from its path. I mean, some, some of it's obvious they let women in. <laughs> 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 but, but, you know, it, it's been a, the 20th century has been an interesting story for the school to it kind has. of navigate the changing demographic geographically and the population of students that come and it used to be they were all LC, LC kids and now they're yeah. maybe they're not even all, you know half of them are even Lutheran I mean mm -hmm. I don't even know what the, what that looks like but so to kind of reorganize the mission without actually changing it 
Um, I, I'm sure there's plenty of room for criticism about how things could have gone better or whatever. Oh, but but always, it sounds like always, it, but, but to, that the arc is still there and that the trajectory is still kind of on target. Is that true? And what, kind of what, I guess not what you say to that kind of criticism, but what, how, how would you reframe that for people who maybe would get stuck on those kinds of things? Well, I would, well, uh, first I would want to know what part of the school legacy they think is not being upheld uh, because you're going to get that you're going to get that argument from a number of directions. Uh, uh, I, I can remember hearing when I was on the board uh, the question, well, is Augsburg even Christian anymore? Um, and of course, that was easy to answer. Yes. Uh, I would refer people to uh, the chapel services, the, uh, the campus ministry. Uh, I would also refer them to the changed cultural milieu that uh, Whereas, as an LFC student here, I, I think there was one Catholic kid in my class. And there were some other kinds of Lutherans, and even an occasional Methodist. Um, and now students are needing to learn how to, to relate to students of other faiths. And that's, that's a big change in our society. It's, it's a big change in the school, and I just, I think, I think we need to keep asking the school, how are you remaining faithful to the gospel in this new world? Um, but I think we can't dictate they've got to do it the way they always did. Uh, so that, that you know, if, if the question is, is Augsburg uh, still intellectually rigorous? Um, hey, we got a Nobel Prize winner. I, I think we, and yet, and we're still, not skimming the top, the cream off the top, in terms of whom we admit, uh, and that can be that can be a challenge. Uh, I think one of the things that's got to be make it interesting to teach here, and also very challenging to teach here, is the whole emphasis on a diverse student body. Uh, it's got to be a lot easier to teach a homogeneous student body than a diverse one. Uh, I've taken a couple of classes in the, um, the weekend college, and that's a completely different problem. They're probably more like those uh, guys on the GI Bill, uh, making room for their education in the middle of an already full life. Uh, so the, the, the diversity here is not just ethnic. It's all kinds age, life experience, and I think that's part of what makes it an exciting place. Um, I have said I never, I never had the luxury of taking time off for four years to go to college and, and dropping out of, I mean, I, my, the rest of my life went on while I was in college and I had to learn to juggle all those balls. And I think that's what students are doing today too. It's become long important. answer to your question. No, Sorry. it's great. And the, 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 I mean, there are, those are all. I don't. I mean, I'm not speaking to any specific criticism, but all those things. I mean, mm -hmm. and there is kind of that. Um, if if it's too insulated and too isolated, can you prepare people for a pluralistic world? Exactly. And that all of a sudden becomes a much greater challenge. Yeah. Teaching people to be Christian in an exclusively Christian yeah. fantasy world is not hard at all. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody could probably do that. Yeah. So. Uh, so giving them all kinds of experiences and letting them, it's kind of like learning another language uh, and being kind of comfortable in it, but not also, uh, you know, feeling lost in it and yeah. being able to kind of know your, what your center is in that. Yeah. Um, and I, I agree with you that the, I think the brilliance of, uh, and it isn't that, you, that they accept, you know, horrible students, no. but, you know, teaching the top 1% <laughs> can't be that hard. <laughs> Yeah. Dig a little deeper and turn, and then turn out great students. Mm -hmm. And you've done mm -hmm. far more work than you know some of the Ivy League folks who yeah. just you know take take the best ones. And how hard how hard could that be? So I, I think there's yeah. there's a little more it's, of a challenge there. Yeah, it, it's what keeps things interesting. Around here, I think. Anything I didn't ask you about the Augsburg story about oh, uh, I don't think so, about I don't what think. what has how has your education oh. and all the stuff that you learn either academically or or just from bumping into great folks, how has that prepared you for the rest of your life? Well, I have, uh, I have continued to live my life with trying to keep all the balls up in the air at once. 
uh, I have one of the most checkered careers, that you, you know, which is another way of saying I, I never could keep a job. I, I have held a number of different jobs, worked within the church uh, in various capacities a lot. Uh, I wrote the Great American Novel a couple of times and never got it published, so that was my failed career. Uh, I think one of the things, oh, a lot of things that, that Augsburg and the whole, my, my upbringing gave me, prepared me. I, the good academic pre preparation here, I, I would still argue for that. Um, that wonderful spiritual freedom of, of being absolutely confident in God's love and God's presence along with the freedom to make a fool of myself, uh, which I have done on occasion. Um, that's, you know, the, the, the reverse side of that responsibility that was laid on us is that it could engender a lot of guilt because one never completely gives one's best to the master. And uh, if you focus on the failures, you can feel pretty rotten, but I think I was taught not to focus on the failures. Well, and the school's story has plenty of kind of near disasters, financial oh, particularly. Yeah. I <laughs> dodging the bullet every decade, it seemed like there was some new crisis or something. Yeah. So the, the faithfulness to just kind of, this is going to work, mm -hmm. and we'll just do what we can. And well, so the stories of those men's quartets that went out singing in the churches to raise money for Augsburg, you know, and now they're the Centennial Singers. Same guys in a lot of cases. <laughs> when you talk to Mert, you can talk about that. I will ask him. Yeah. Good. Anything I didn't ask you about? No, I think we pretty well. I had a great time. I hope we've covered it. I think so. Thank Good. you.